Snack and Yak is back. My name is Trent. As the founding pastor, I can tell you today that we did Snack and Yak from the very first Sunday 21 years ago. Got sidetracked a little bit. Hey, it got kind of expensive when we hit 400 people. Uh, and so we kind of toned it down a little bit from, it used to be like a buffet, I'll just be honest, a dessert buffet. Um, that's the only reason I came. Um, but with COVID, it's been gone for a while. And the reality is standing around, chatting, snacking, and yakking uh, has always been a key part of our DNA, and we're really excited that it is back. As said, you can volunteer. The good news is to volunteer now, you do not have to cook the stuff, bake the stuff, bring the stuff. We just need it set out carefully, sanitized, all that kind of stuff, uh, and refill it. I think the coffee might be tied to that. I don't even know. But just make snack and yak happen. If you'd be willing to do that, uh, the serve card, you could just volunteer for that or get online and volunteer. Uh, bottom line, it, unless someone comes through for me in the next 10 minutes, I won't know until after the service, come see me. But the first two people that volunteer to serve, volunteer once a month, once every two months, whatever, to help coordinate, put out the snacks for snack and yak, I have two tickets to this afternoon's senior day MSU basketball game free for you. You said, isn't that kind of like bribery? No, it's exactly like it. It's good. So <laughs> let, let me know. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this family that likes to snack and likes to yak. Uh, we just give you this morning. Thank you for each one that's been here earlier today in this service online. Uh, just meet us here this morning. We thank you for your word, that we can dive into your word. And uh, we just want to hear from it this morning. So we give you this time in Jesus' name. I, I also just, Lord, pray for Ukraine. Just whenever we come to you, just a reminder that uh, believers there, even lost people there, need an intervention uh, for this invasion. So we don't know your whole plan, uh, but we know that you are God. So we place it at your feet, that, that request uh, to stop this invasion. And for those, especially believers today in that country, pastors, leaders of ministry that are just 24-7 pouring into meeting people's needs. Bless them today, Father. May they sense your presence like they've never sensed it, and your peace and your comfort, uh, and just meet people's needs through them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Simply follow any way is where we've been the last couple of weeks. So two months into the year, it's already two months into the year, I just had to stop for a second and realize where we've been, because this is kind of a, a longer journey than some. And we started with what was going to be a one-week sermon. Is this, I did it for the New Year's weekend before Chase kicked off his next series. Kind of a stand-alone, we call it. Uh, and I looked at Galatians 5.25 that says this, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So it's all about being in step with what God wanted from our life. The NLT says, since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading, follow, simply follow, the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So we had this Take It Step logo. I even made these little stickers. Anybody know where your sticker is right now? Four, that's great. <laughs> I know where mine is, it's on my computer. I encourage you to, to stop for a second and say, what's just, you can't solve the whole world's problems, completely change your life overnight, but you can take a step. What's one thing you could do to be more likely to be in step with Jesus? Uh, the message, the, the paraphrase translation of the Bible, paraphrase of the Bible, says it this way in Galatians 5.25. Oh, I'll read it to you then. Since this is the kind, see how we work together? This, this family is amazing. Uh, since this is the kind of life we've chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure we don't just hold on to it as an idea in our head or a sentiment in our heart, but work out its implications in every detail of our life. So that part's the same. But I really caught my attention and said, if you're going to really take this step, keep in step with the Spirit, don't just hold this idea of following Jesus as an idea in your head or a sentiment in your heart. And then we talked about that in that sermon of Take a Step, that we have millions of messages a week into, I should have had a little diagram where it fed 
messages from the world, from your friends, good and bad, that tell you what to think and how to feel. And we know that our will is determined by what we think and what we feel. So we constantly hear, think this, feel that, do that. And the challenge to take a step was, how often do you consider what God thinks, how God feels, what God wants you to do? That's the tension. So the request was to take a step, do one thing that helps you listen to God's voice better. And that's where Simply Follow ended up going. It really was taking a look at who Jesus was. We're reading the Gospels, many of us, over these 90 days. If you're on that plan, you're into Luke now. We've already read Matthew and Mark, maybe more Bible than you've read in 10 years. Uh, you're in Luke, headed for John. Uh, and we're looking at those Gospels to see what is the story of Jesus. Who was he? What did he do? What did he say? And then walk in his steps. Try to be like him, do like him, and say like him. Now, the last three weeks... We cranked it up a notch. We don't mess around with River's Edge. And we said, what if Jesus says something that's really hard to understand? What if he says something that you just don't want to do? And we said, you simply follow. Very good. You simply follow anyway. So, and if you haven't been here, just for fun, we've had three already. First one is John 14, 6. And Jesus said there, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, the world doesn't like that message. That sounds so exclusive, so judgmental. How can you be the only way? Isn't there one God? Don't all religions lead the same way? Had all those conversations. Go back and listen to it if you missed it. But the point was, this verse the heart of Jesus here was not to exclude anyone from the gospel. John 3.16 says, God loved the world so much he sent his only son, so anyone who believes in him will be saved. How many people does anyone leave out? None. None. This verse doesn't have anything to do with leaving people out. It's the opportunity everyone has to choose to follow Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm the way. You can get to the Father through me. That's good news, not bad news. The next week, Chase talked about the heart. Uh, Matthew 15, 19 says, From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. <coughs> Yikes. Is that your heart? <laughs> so Chase challenges us to check your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. And the fact is... Uh, what we have in our heart stewing in there is what leads to some of those actions that we really don't want to be about in our life. Now, last week, you we went to Matthew 7, still in the Sermon on the Mount, said, judge not that you won't be judged. But the real verse is chapter, verse 5. First, oh, there is a process for judging. That Everyone just says just verse 1. Christians can't judge. Now what it says. The world thinks we're judgmental. Research has shown that. We've got to stop that. Stop trying to cram this down people's throats that aren't interested. Right. We need to build a relationship, get them interested, and then share it in a positive way with them. But it says, first get rid of the log in your own eye. So if we deal with it, Chase taught us last week, then you'll see well, you won't be a hypocrite, enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So sometimes... It is really not only good, really helpful to judge if you're helping someone deal with a speck. If you had a something in your eye and you've tried to wash it, you tried to do something, and you go to your spouse or friend and go, hey, can you get something in my eye? They really got that out. You know, just a tiny thing is really annoying, right, in your eye. If they got that out, would you be mad? Would you say, hey, would you put that speck back in there? No. You say, thanks, man. That, get that speck out. I really appreciate it. That's what judging should look like. So these tough statements of Jesus that on the surface might look tough or you don't understand them, we dive in, chat about them, and go, wow, that was good. And we have several more coming. Today's not, I think, compared to world religions and adultery and murder and lust, today is really tame. But I think the most people yet are not going to like it. That's my guess. But Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25, this. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Let me read that again. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. 
it was easy to say you didn't want that, well, those first three weeks stuff. But just, just out of curiosity, if you look back over, let's just go this last week, right? This last week, since you're here last week, if you're here. Was there a single time this week when you thought about something in your day or in your past or your future that you would say you worried? Don't you hate that? Why don't you just say, you know what, cut down the worry a little bit. Now, I, I get on board with that. But he said not to worry about everyday life. So the, the big chunk of this passage, this is, Mark, this is Matthew 6, uh, 25 through 34. That's the end of chapter 6. Uh, he lays out this argument for the almost, uh, except for the last few verses, these first verses we'll look at. But then I think he gives us two really helpful thoughts in verses 33 and 34. So let's look at his kind of his ramp up, his background to it first. Uh, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly, for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Just stop before I finish it. Do you think you would be more valuable to God than a bird? I think there's a really good chance. Because birds are pretty cool. Some are kind of pretty. Some of you have feeders and they flop around out there. But look at our creation. Who God made us to be with our mind, will, and emotions on top of that. Not too many birds are sitting on the feeder contemplating the world. How do I feel about that? What do I think about that? They have no idea. They're just eating. Aren't you far more valuable to them than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I, I love that question. So you worry a lot? It's almost like Jesus is saying, how's that working out for you? Your life a lot better now? You think you're going to live longer because you got that figured out? No, may, actually, matter of fact, the opposite might be true that you might live less because of the stress and anxiety and you know, what it does in our bodies. There's a, lot, there's a lot of medicine about that. He goes on to say, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they are. So he's, he's talking creation, birds, animals, aren't they cool? Puppy dogs, ah. And then he goes more to the, the plant kind of world. And he goes, aren't lilies beautiful? I'm always amazed about uh, corn, you know, a kernel. And we have the phrase in Michigan, knee high by the 4th of July. You plant that puppy, not the kernel, not the dog. <laughs> Don't bury your dog. <laughs> uh, the kernel goes in there. By the 4th, I mean, it's like big green plants. And that's not the amazing part. It's that next four weeks. I did this once years ago. Try it. They say, if it's totally quiet in the, in the midst of that spurt, like through July, if it's quiet enough and the wind's not blowing, you can hear corn grow. That's crazy. And then they, they can snap things off and put butter on them and eat them off that kernel. That, that, that's what Jesus is talking to say, take a look. I think God has this under control. He goes on next chunk. He says this. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and, and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why he has so little faith? God can really take care of you. Verse 31, he kind of puts the wrap on it, and that's kind of our, our first point. So let's jump to that. So don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, and sometimes us. Let's just be honest. They can dominate. Just how am I going to take care of myself? But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So if you're taking any notes, point one is your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. As you think about worry in your life, things you stress about over this week, did you ever stop to, to remind yourself your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Ask yourself the question, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And as it ends, he will certainly care for you. Uh, 
I've shared this a few times in different settings here, but I've shared it dozens of times in camps of high school students or weekend youth retreats, the, the first opening night. I talk about three lies, messages we got to get past and not believe to be true. Uh, the better you look, the better you are. That's appearance-based acceptance. And that's, this look, look at all our advertising. Our advertising. That's where, where our world lives. It's how you look. Second lie is the better you do, the better you are. Performance-based acceptance. That's, that's like judging each other on what we accomplish and place our value on that. Third lie is the more you have, the better you are. That's a great American battle, right? Because we have the resources. So we're constantly dreaming about the next purchase or the joy that the next thing we have will bring us. Those lies are pouring into us tons of anxiety, worried about how we look, what we do, and what we have. It's not getting us where we want to get. So we're so worried about what other people think about us, when in reality, they're so worried about what people think about them, they barely notice us. Did you catch that? They're so worried. We're so worried about what they think. But they're so worried about what other people think about them, they barely notice us. I like to ask people, a million years from now, will this really matter? Does it, does it really make a difference? Or are you just wasting a lot of time and energy on something that just reflects that God doesn't get this? I got to worry about this. No, your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. So Peter says it this way. He, he followed Jesus three years, right? So he, he knew when Jesus said, you don't have to worry, that it was true. So he, he repeats that in 1 Peter 5, 7. We use this verse a lot. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. He will take care of you. I love that he does talk about those lilies and the birds and the simplicity, however incredible creation is. So I really do believe he's saying, as Jesus says, if that's how he treats the birds and lilies, how is he going to treat you really, really good? Max Lucado wrote a book entitled uh, Anxious for Nothing. And maybe you hear me mention Lucado every once in a while. I highly recommend his readings. I have every book he's ever written. Uh, he says, belief always precedes behavior. What you believe to be true, what you are thinking. Belief always precedes behavior. To change the way a person responds to life, change what a person believes about life. Do you believe that your heavenly Father already knows everything you need, and he'll give you what you need? He talks about thought management. And I love the statement. He says this. He says, uh, there are many things in life over which you have no choice. Just think about this. This is true. Your parents, you had no vote. Your siblings, no vote. Your in-laws, <laughs> you wish. Uh, where you live, weather. I'm going to Florida today. I love Michigan, but I hate the cold. And it's 60 today, so that's a good deal, isn't it? Uh, but you, you can't really control those things. We spend sometimes so much time worrying about it or being anxious over it. He says, though, you can choose what you think about. You can choose. Thought management. You can say, why am I worried about this? It's not even for another six months. Uh, do a lot of marriage counseling when people are getting married. That's always a little bit humorous. How freaked out someone can get about a 22-minute ceremony a year and a half from now. I know there's a lot of details to it. But the fact is, you can choose whether something's going to stress you out or become worry. You can choose what you think about. The Bible's uh, most common word for the Greek term uh, for, for worry or anxiety is really a compound word. Greek does this a lot. They, they put a noun and a verb together. So we, we have to have multiple words to, to mean the same thing. And their word for a anxious literally is a noun meaning your mind and a verb meaning to divide. So they're saying worry is to divide your mind. Yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I want to ask what God thinks, how God feels, and what God would like me to do, but I'm pouring all my energy into what everyone else thinks I should think, what everyone else thinks I should feel, and what everybody else thinks I should do. The tension is killing you, literally. The Life Application Bible, I think, nails that. I don't know if they had that definition when whoever wrote this commentary wrote it, but divide the mind. It's all Satan has to do. 
He doesn't have to make you do something bad. He just has to stop you from doing the good. And if you can sit there and stew about it and get all worked up about it, he's delighted. So the Life Application Bible says this, worrying is bad. That's unfortunate. It's, it's not bad because we all do it. It's, it's, tr- it's troublematic, okay? It's problematic. It's troublesome. There's two words. So worrying can be problematic because it is a subtle form of distrust in God. When believers worry, they are saying that they don't trust that God will provide and that they doubt he cares or he can handle their situation. Now, there's three things. There. I don't think we think any of those out loud necessarily. But if we did believe we could trust and provide that he knows our needs, if we really did think he cares, if he really can handle it, then why am I worrying so much about it? Why why aren't I going to God? It leads to a helpless, hopeless feeling that causes them to feel paralyzed. As I said, not necessarily doing bad, but just not doing good. You're stuck. Worry tends to do that. We get stuck. So you say, okay, Jesus, that's, that's a pretty good little argument, you just to lay out in 10 verses. You know, look at the birds, look at the lilies, look at your father. He knows what's going on. He, he gets you. He knows what you need. He will give you what you need. Let's close in prayer, right? But he adds a couple other things, two more things, just in case you need a little more motivation. You go, well, what would I do then if I wasn't worrying? What would I do with all my time? <laughs> Verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Very famous verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, King James. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. I know the whole thing is really important. I think people could quote the first part of this verse if you grew up in the church. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's not the whole sentence. It's seek it and do it. It's Learn what Jesus, who Jesus is, what he did, what he said, and follow him. It's learning and understanding, reading the Gospels, and then putting them into practice. It's choosing to live righteously, to do the things God's asking us to do. You've got to read that whole sentence. That's really important. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. That, this for what it's worth, that does say need, not want. Can't insert Corvette in there. But he will give you everything you need. A good paraphrase is put God first. Simply follow. Try to make it relevant to our little series. You'll be fine. TCB. You go, I don't know what that translation is. That's Trent Clark Bushnell. <laughs> Trust God. Put him first. Above all else. Simply follow. You'll be fine. I think I'll make bumper stickers. But you guys probably don't use those either. So, <laughs> Seek the kingdom of God above all else. About three times a year. Oh, I did want to mention uh, Matthew 7, 24. There it is. Like, in, man, she's good. Anyone who listens, we started the, the Take a Step series with this. And then I, I used it. Chase has used it. It's kind of been a theme here as we look at, read the Gospels. What does God say? Well, what Jesus said about what God says is anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, simply follow. You're wise. It's going to work for you. So if you can follow this teaching, don't worry about it. God knows what you need. Seek his kingdom and do it. It's going to work a whole lot better for you. Uh, The way it said in the Old Testament, my life verses, I get them in here three times a year no matter what. This is number one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There's the above all else piece again. Now, just one of the things you do. Yeah, I'm sort of religious. Now, how about sell out? Trust God. He knows your needs. He'll provide your needs with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. I always say it doesn't say kiss your brains goodbye. You don't have to kiss your brains goodbye to follow Jesus. Matter of fact, I often said you can't follow Jesus without using your brain. You got you to figure out the truth and say, yeah, God does love me. I did resist him. He made it possible to fix that break because I've resisted him by sending Christ. All I have to do is respond to that. That's the truth. So if there's something I don't understand, Jesus said that, what does he mean? All this says, assume Jesus is right. And you need to figure it out. And if you talk to people, read some books, read some commentary, do some cross-references, sooner or later, you'll probably understand. And if it's one of these things we just never quite get, 
If you walk up to Jesus in the, in the streets of gold in heaven someday, go, hey, one thing I, rem- I just never got. What did you mean? I think he's going to get a real kick out of explaining that stuff to us. And we're going, duh, I did not see that. Well, you're not Jesus. You're just trying to be like him. Seek his will in all you do. There's the all again. And he will show you which path to take. You will know what to do. You don't have to worry and say, oh, I just don't know what to do next. Seek him all in, all out. Do the, live righteously. Do the right stuff. He'll show you what path to take. So seek his kingdom. And then the last verse is kind of our, our third step. After acknowledging the fact that God really does understand your needs. So we should seek him, his kingdom, do what he's asking us to do. I love this. He ends in verse 34. Focus on today. I initially had this phrase up there because I was trying to use all the quotes right from the scripture, but it was a little clumsy. So I made this up. Focus on today, but the verse, the, the verse 34 says, so don't worry about tomorrow. Didn't he already say at the beginning? Yes. Good communication is start with your point, end with your point. Jesus was a good communicator. Surprised? <laughs> no, I'm not surprised either. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I like that. Just focus on today. You've probably got something you can work on. And if you've got it all together, there's probably someone else that has something you could help them work on. But don't waste our time worrying about stuff that hasn't happened yet. You had a collection of quotes from a couple of different places. Uh, I'll just read them to you. Anxiety takes our attention from the right now, the focus on today, and puts it back or directs it back then or out there. Either you're going back going, why did that happen to me? Why did they do that? Why did they say that? Why didn't they say that? Why didn't I say this back? Can't we just spend all sorts of energy worrying about stuff that's done? It'll never change. Why are you wasting your time worrying about that? Or in the same way, the future, all the what ifs. What if they say this? What if they do this? What if this happens? What if this does, doesn't happen? What if I don't get this? What if I do get that? What if, what if, what if, what if? None of that's even happened yet. Would you just relax? <laughs> it's easy to do, but it's not helping anything. Worry is thinking negatively, fearing the worst. So it goes on to say, don't borrow trouble by assuming the worst before anything even happens. Assuming the worst. If you look at the message paraphrase of this last verse, it brings that into focus. It says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. Don't worry. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes, because he will meet your needs. So Jesus said, I tell you, don't worry about every day life. And if you really seek him and focus on today, a natural thing to do is to chat with God, which introduces the most famous worry verse. Uh, some people have said the most referenced verse in the Bible. I struggle to think that it beats John 3, 16, but I use it a lot too. It's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Now, again, Scripture so, could be so much easier if it said, don't worry about, about more than 50%. Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> but sometimes it's very specific. Anything. How many things does anything not include? Nothing. Zero. No, thank you. How many things does anything not include? Nothing. nothing. Instead, pray about Everything. There's nothing God doesn't care about. We already read that verse. If you care about it, tell God you care about it. He cares about it. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. I I was really worried. I feel okay right now. It's not some magic potion prayer. It's just putting into practice what we just talked about. It's putting into practice, okay, God, I know you know this because you know everything I need. And God, I know you can do something about this. And God, I'm doing my best to seek your kingdom and do what you're asking me to do. So would you help me process this? In that context, we can experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and our minds. There you go. What we think, what we feel, that will drive what we do. 
then we'll make the right choices. So, of course, we'll experience his peace as you simply follow Jesus. Good paraphrase. Simply follow. Lucado writes, peace happens when people pray. So as I work through this passage, these 25 to 34, the, 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 for the bullets were just easy. And then it's kind of, again, we're celebrating what Jesus taught and what we can follow. And he says, your heavenly father knows all your needs. So seek his kingdom and live righteously and focus on today. But I, I, I always like to ask, so what? At the end of the message. I, I think for a period of time, I used to do that almost every message. have a slide at the end. So what? If there's a so what to today, it's this. If I put this into practice even a little bit better and begin to experience God's peace a little bit more, wouldn't it be natural for my peace to begin to extend to other people's worry? That's the church. That's Christianity in our culture, in this world. Wouldn't it be great if our peace impacted others' anxiety? And, and this little minute 35 video is just a snippet example of that. But I wanted you to leave you with, with something visual. So take a look. So proudly we hail at the stars at stars. Stars light, last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through. So gallantly streaming, and the rockets red black, and the CNN gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangle? give Maurice Cheeks a round of applause there. Uh, Maurice Cheeks was an NBA player, uh, Philadelphia 76 was most of his career. I think he retired like 11th in history or 7th in history in assists. He was a point guard. But that was probably the biggest assist of his career as coach of the Trail Portland Trailblazers, uh, little Natalie Gilbert, 12 years old. Did, did you catch her face when she blew that first line? And she kind of looked at the right. I mean, it was just panic. Do you think she was a little nervous, worried, walking out there to sing? I, I'm sure she was. Most of us would be. And all of a sudden, the, the, the quote we had earlier, hopeless and helpless, that was Natalie. And uh, Maurice Cheeks, a, a confident guy that's been on the NBA floor his whole life, chose. He didn't have to do that. He couldn't sing, that's for sure. <laughs> but just him walking out and his hand on her shoulder Repeating that line, and you know, it's even like two lines later, she blew another line. And that's exactly when not only Maurice Chicks kicked him with that line, the entire, you could hear the volume difference in the state, in the arena. And everybody, it impacted everybody in the house. I, again, it's just a, one silly little example, but I think somehow it's a snapshot. If the church would get a bunch of the family together that really simply follow Jesus. Not just play a religious game, show up for attendance checkpoints, but really say, I really believe my father knows what's going on in my life. He knows what I need. I, I, I'm all in. I'm going to seek him, his kingdom, what he's doing, and put it into practice. Not just tell the people they should. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to focus on today and do the best I can. Then I really believe his peace will be a real thing in our life. 
And I believe we could extend that peace to someone's el- someone else's anxiety. And who knows how many people might join in. Cool? Let's pray. Father, whew, you are good. Life certainly has its challenges. We all can share our stories. But Jesus, these words are powerful. And I don't think they're outdated. I do believe, Father, that you know our needs. And that you will take care of us. And the quicker we are to acknowledge that, to seek you, the more we'll experience it. Your goodness and your peace. And I do pray for people that are connected to our lives, that are feeling hopeless and helpless. Give us the opportunities, Jesus, to make a difference and give us the courage to step into those opportunities, whether we think we're the one good enough to do it or not. Pray for your blessing on each one here today as we do our best to simply follow anyway. Amen.